welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and Design the Dutch Podcast. Our guest today is Frank Peters. Welcome, Frank. Hi there. Good oh, to see you, Lefou. Fantastic. Good to see you. So tell us, tell us a bit about you and your work. Well, I'll tell you a bit about me, first of all. I'm a designer um, by living and by training and by practice. Uh, I started out uh, in art school, moving on to Polytechnic, uh, worked as a, a display designer, exhibition designer, built up my own consultancy. Um, used to work in lots of different disciplines, sort of all coming together to, to, to operate and provide creative consultancy to clients. Did that for quite some time. And now I do this job, which is Chief Executive of the Chartered Society of Designers. And the interesting thing I find about uh, working and doing the job I do at the moment is it's no different from any design process. It's mm -hmm. a matter of design thinking. So. In fact, whatever I do is a matter of design thinking. Um, and that's the way in which the society approaches the development of its strategies, its initiatives, its programs. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's what, we, what we're doing. Um, I'm getting a message on here, Lefteris, which is saying that um, your bandwidth is low. And I'm not no, it's seeing fine, it's, it's fine, a bit blurry. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Um, okay, so no, I, I, I'll ignore it. Uh, brilliant. I mean, uh, so you have watched a lot of, uh, a, a wide uh, amount of time, yeah, a large amount of time, design. So you've been in design for how many decades? I mean, decades. <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> but it's quite right. It is decades. Uh, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been in design for, for almost almost three almost three decades, two and a half decades. So you know, it's... I, I think I'm I think I'm beating you actually on that of one. Of course. So. <laughs> I guess I guess I first started designing, but I didn't know it was design when I was a kid mm. sitting next to my mom. Mm. Um, I, 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 I I remember a talk that Phil Cleaver did with you, and he was actually talking about his background and how he ended up being uh, in design, but he wasn't sure what design was. It was art and craft, and that's exactly the same. I used to used to sit, and my mum used to have the colouring books. I remember the first one was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and it was always a case of don't go over the lines. Do the colours. Don't don't go don't go over the lines, and and from that point on, it was at school doing the same thing, drawing all the time, taking things trying to deconstruct things, in the, but, but not knowing it was deconstruction or re-engineering, but trying to break things, but trying to see how things work and, 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 and drawing and, 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 be, and people saying, oh, well, you can, you can draw, that's interesting. And that, that was always a fascinating thing. That was, actually, that was actually the initial design processes, but not realizing that was design. So that was being, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old, um, something. So let's see. So. Um, I'd say six decades in that case of working wow, in design. Wow, wow, wow. Um, and, you know, going to art school, okay, at, at school doing what you used to do then was called technical drawing, TV. Um, mm. so, so that was a development of, of, of design. Then going to art school, which I went to in Birmingham, Birmingham College of Art. Um, uh, it, it was an interesting period because it's foundation here. So we used to have then for students was that they would go into a foundation and they would experiment with everything possible. It didn't matter what it was. And it wasn't just related to art, uh, whether it was painting or sculpture or three-dimensional or two-dimensional. It actually involved everything else. It involved music, it involved philosophy, it involved uh, writing, scripting, poetry, etc. So the whole thing was actually together in a foundation course. And you could explore all of these various avenues, photography, printing, um, uh, constructing um, and you've got a, a good feel for for what designers are all about which is Absolutely. using an exercise in every part of the brain and every part mm -hmm. of the visual muscle mm -hmm. and then all of the various other aspects of how you actually think about all of these elements and how they combine how they separate and so that was really interesting and then uh, I, 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 I blew it I didn't like it particularly at, at, at the end and, and didn't know what to do 
Um, because I didn't know what the, the, the follow on was at the time. There was an enormous amount of conceptual art going on um, in, 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 in art colleges. So you, you, you'd go to art college and you'd get in the lift and somebody would be there sort of singing and playing an electric guitar and, 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 and it was art or somebody would be in there sort of in a trance or um, meditating or and then, and, then, and then coming up with weird sort of you know, connections of words. And it was all very conceptual at the time. And I, it just didn't fit with what I was comfortable with of, of physically touching, making, um, doing things. And uh, I went to work in a factory. Um, I, I was on the wow. end of a bayer belt. Um, they used to make, uh, they used to make electric appliances. And I was at the end of a, a and, and used to put them in a box, pack them, um, stack them and then click a button. And that's how you used to get paid. Um, but I tell you what, I learned so much about packing and stacking, packaging, um, information on boxes, et cetera, et cetera, how, 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 how it reads the right way around, how you never put anything that's, uh, that actually looks to you right when somebody else is going to handle it in a different manner. So again, you know, it's all these things and experiences that come together in design. You just never know what you're going to actually be working with or what you're going to be asked to achieve to make somebody else's life easier, better, um, et cetera. So I did, I did that for a year and then heard about a course that was at uh, Polytechnic, Lanchester Polytechnic, okay. Coventry University now. Um, and that was a course, and it was called um, Three-Dimensional Design for Visual Communication. And I thought, well, that sounds, that sounds interesting. And a, fr a friend referred me, me to it and went along, had an interview. Um, got on with the tutors who were actually in practice. Um, they used to practice in the, the car industry. I come from Birmingham in the Midlands, so we're very much focused on the car industry. Um, and it was it was an interesting period. So I think there were two of us on the course, so it was incredibly um, focused. And well, well, there were I two specialized of you. There were, two of you. Sorry, sorry. there were two of you. Two, two students. Two students? Just two students. Wow. Uh, yeah. That, so that was, and, and, and not only that, you, you, you've got a grant as well to go. So, and there weren't any fees. So, you know, I'm sorry for everybody out there listening who has to end up coping with the situation now. And I think, you know, we at that time were incredibly privileged to be able to have that sort of education, that wide diversity of education with the diversity of um, lecturers and people in industry and practicing in manufacturing industry, because that was incredibly important for working in design it wasn't just service industry i mean now you know in the uk only 20 percent of the economy is actually um the manufacturing industry so it, 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 it was a good period and I, I came out of college in a recession um i think that's also an interesting um situation for uh, working in design because the, the whole economy is trying to restructure in a way um that opens up quite a lot of opportunities. People need to innovate to actually move forward. And, you know, I've been through a couple of recessions in practice, and of course now we're in this situation. And that's why I, I take heart from, you know, fr from the fact that designers have some opportunities. I know it's going to be incredibly difficult for graduates coming out this year, incredibly difficult. I mean, a lot of them in design are not going to end up having their year-end shows, which is, an incredibly important part of the process to move from, 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 from learning to earning to come out and actually display what you've been doing, what you've been thinking about, what you've put your heart and soul into mm -hmm. for the last six months. They're not going to be able to actually put it on display and talk to people about it coming around, um, looking at those shows. And that, that, that is in some ways disheartening. And I, I, I get that. I mean, at the society where, we're doing our best to try and um, uh, come up with solutions to that, like virtual end year shows, um, in order to help students because it is such an incredible part of the process that, that it's, it's one of their first interfaces with the outside world, world of selling what they've been doing. And, you know, design doesn't exist unless somebody actually wishes to commission it. I mean, it's otherwise it becomes an indulgence, it becomes. Uh, a, 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 an art form. And nothing wrong in that. I have anything wrong with it. And somebody comes along and says, "Well, I like it. I'll buy it." But that's not that's that's not what my practice as a designer is. Mm -hmm. Not what mm -hmm. our members' practices are about. What it's mm -hmm. about is actually being able to provide 
um, solutions um, to, to problems that people don't sometimes know that they've got. Um, that, that's also an interesting part of it. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be difficult, but I think the opportunities are going to be there. Um, they may not seem it now, but anybody who's ever come out of um, a, a, a design course, I, I think they've always thought it's going to be difficult. Mm. It is. It's, it, it, it's always Absolutely. difficult. Absolutely. Uh, so fantastic. So uh, tell us about the work you're doing now. So you said, for example, one of the things is you're, you're helping uh, colleges with virtual shows. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell us about the work you're doing now. Well, this all this all goes back actually to an approach that we had in the society in looking at how do we support designers, and um, uh, I think one of the one of the issues that we had with uh, designers is always that they they think that that they're, they're talking to people it's all falling on deaf ears. Is that people don't understand what it is that they're what they're what they're doing? How, how do you explain what you do as a designer? It's it's very it's it's it, 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 it's it's sometimes easy if you say, well, what does a solicitor do? Well, a solicitor um, either keeps you out of trouble or or gets you out of trouble. Um, an accountant, you know, the same probably you know keeps you out of trouble, makes sure you pay your taxes on time, etc. You, you you can ask a specific question of certain professionals uh, of, of certain jobs. You ask a designer what they do. It's a very difficult thing to explain. And what, what, I, what we looked at was, well, do designers actually understand what it is that they do? There's a lot of neuroscience involved in the whole process of creativity, a lot yeah. of research done, yeah. academic, as to what that is. But that's all well and good if you want to sit down and read a PhD or a paper on it. But how do you end up saying to somebody who says, well, uh, why do I need a designer? What do you do? Very difficult thing to explain. So we thought, well, okay. In order for a designer to explain what they do, they're going to have to understand what it is that they're doing themselves. They're going to have to put it into some sort of context and have a vocabulary for for for, for describing this. And so we said, okay, well, what does a designer do, and what what makes a designer? And we looked at developing a whole. We thought this is not about the out. This is not about the output of design. It's about the design process. It's what makes a designer. And we we started to look at um, the qualities. And and, and we looked at years and years of assessment. I mean, we've been going since 1930. And I suspect we've we've got records of assessments going back to the um, 1950s, um, pretty accurate records of assessment. And I'm privileged to be able to access the archive and look at the archive and all of the various membership assessments. So we looked at those and said, well, hang on, how have these people been assessed? What have the assessors looked for when they've said, okay, um, we believe that uh, you are a competent designer. And we went through the paperwork and we started ticking some off. I mean, some was very specific, some was a bit vague, depending on you know the, the people who were assessing, but we, we gathered that information. Then we started looking at all of the work that was going on at the time. This would have been about mm, the early noughties, about 2003, 2004. And so we looked at all that work that was going on about the definitions of design. A lot of work that was done by the UK Design Council as well at the time, which was stimulating by Nesta, by other organisations. Mm. Mm. Um, they were very active in, 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 in these fields. We looked at all of that and we started conducting some interviews with designers, a lot of anecdotal evidence we collected. We said, okay, there is something about the DNA of a designer that's different to the DNA of somebody else who's a solicitor, who is an accountant, who's a a surveyor. And so we we broke it all down and said, okay, well, there there are certain genes. It, 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 It also coincided with the whole genome project and the way in which people were looking at what makes up what makes up a, a, a person, a personality. Um, you know, there were things like designer babies going on and how you how, how people are constructed, how they think. And we, we looked at this and we came up with um, uh, the, I think I've got a notification that come up, so I'll, 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 I'm sorry if that appeared. Um, so we, we looked at that and we said, okay, it falls down into, two, into four things, which is um, professionalism, the skills and the knowledge. And the one thing you can't avoid is the creativity, because that's what differentiates designers. And we said, okay, 
But you can't just say creativity or any of these things. We have to then define them. So we broke those down again into each one into four categories and said, okay, well, in professionalism, there's, um, there's the interpersonal communications, there's process. So there are, there, are, there are four structures in each of those four core criteria. But within each of those, there's a contextual uh, element, which is if you're a designer and in professionalism, you're working as an interior designer, being professional means you have to deal with certain things. If you're a product designer, you have to deal with other certain things. So to be professional as an interior designer, you need to be able to come to terms with um, a, a Disability Act um, a legislation. You have to come to terms with um, building regulations, uh, with party wall acts, with rights of light, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, and this is very much focused on interior architecture, not sorry, not, not, not just interior design. Um, Whereas if you're a product designer, then you need to be familiar with WEE standards, so for um, recyclability, sustainability, etc. Uh, and a whole raft of things. If, if you're a graphic designer, the context is being able to work again with Disability Discrimination Act legislation um, in terms of uh, legibility of texts. Um, incredibly important if you're a graphic designer. Um, you know, this is not just an artistic thing. It's actually about, well, um, you're responsible for creating operating manuals for uh, pharmaceutical and medical packaging. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of professional context involved in all of these areas. So every designer has um, creativity, professionalism, skills and knowledge and the context in which they operate. And so that, that created a framework, which, 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 a framework which we call CPSK. And in order to move that forward, it applies to members of the, our membership categories at, uh, at all levels. So we assess people based on these four uh, characteristics uh, on this framework. And we assess them whether they're students who are probably very high on creativity, but they probably don't have very much in the way of professional experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody who's been working for maybe six decades in design, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. um, they, they, they may not be so creative or maybe as creative as they were, but they certainly very professional or should be very professional um, excuse me so that, that, that that's the, the context of this and we said well okay if this is the profession then how do we promote this um, to develop the, uh, the designers we said well we must focus this also on design education mm -hmm. so what we looked at mm -hmm. well, are the courses developing um, the graduates to come out and uh, embark upon a career in professional design, which we as a professional body will pick up at a later stage, working with them in support and continue developing their profession. So we said, okay, let's look at the courses. And we look at the courses and we take a program specification, we look at the modules, we review those, and we said, do they actually align with CPSK framework and each one of the four uh, subcategories sub of the CPT? CPSK framework. So, for instance, in uh, knowledge, um, do they have modules that align to intellectual property? Um, do, do, is that explained to students? Do they understand this? Does it come into the module mm. uh, at the, in the program specification? And so we said, if we review those, then we can operate an accreditation process for the courses where we say, okay, this course is preparing students for a career in professional design when they graduate. Now, this was a design process. This is a design thinking. Course, this is actually course. design into a, a framework. And when you look at, when we looked at design education, we're saying, okay, well, in the, in the UK specifically, because let me talk about that, uh, mm -hmm. which I know intimately, is that you end up with um, a, a QA, a Quality Assurance Agency, and it, it determines the, the standard of, of education. Um, we work and, you know, I sat on various committees with, as a public sector regulatory body, PSRP, um, at QAA, looking at um, things like subject benchmark statements, um, looking at all of those learning outcomes uh, and, you know, for levels four, five and six and, and so on. And 
what 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 we were what we were looking at here was all educational courses need to be delivered to a certain quality. That's a given. That's mm -hmm. that's set out. That's legislation. That's 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 the rule. Mm -hmm. So you look at all the paperwork that a course will go through for validation, whichever is the discipline, they will all, all have to comply with the, uh, the, 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 the quality assurance agency for the, the, the nation, for the UK, and they will also need to actually comply with the university's autonomous regulation as well. So the, the paperwork is all very similar. They'll all have to have external examiners. They'll all have to have, to have reports, et cetera. The paperwork is very similar when you get to that point. What does change and what is different within the context of the university is the delivery of that to the graduate. And the delivery depends upon the staff, the staff's experience, the resources available, the location, the access that students have to industry, the access they have to clients, um, to external influences, international. It depends on the resource of the university. Mm -hmm. So what we focused on with our accreditation process was the point at which this paperwork and documentation stop, which is important, incredibly important, but how is that delivered? And right. Right. many times it's delivered, and there are, there, are no, there are no issues. It's delivered incredibly well in, in most cases. What, what we wanted to do was say, where you have, may have some... Um, issues in delivery is how can we support that, i.e. can we end up having practitioners go and do workshops, can we end up having practitioners come and talk to students, etc. Mm. How do we help that delivery so that those graduates come out mm. prepared for a career in professional design, which, and, 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 and those, those graduates we will interact with throughout the, the rest of their career until they get to a point at which you know they stop and then we work on exit strategies with them in terms of how they wind down from being a designer um, how they create different portfolios mm -hmm. uh, and so so the whole thing was that we, we, we'll create an accreditation process and part of the delivery um, of this education of this learning experience in universities the end of your shows, end of your shows. Mm. Um, that, you know, do they have the facilities? Do they have enough space for those? Mm. Well, in the current context, they they don't. Yeah. <laughs> so there, you know, there, there are restrictions. So part of our program at the moment is how do we assist them in developing a virtual end of your show um, within, within our support mechanism? Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very long answer to what was a simple question. No, 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 brilliant, brilliant. So, so you're developing, uh, you're developing like a server uh, or or some space or no, we already no, we already we already have that. What we what we have is every accredited course, all of the students on an accredited course have free membership of the Chartered Society of Designers for the whole of their course and for uh, until the end of the calendar year in which they graduate which allows them probably six months while they're either starting employment or what, while they may be starting up as a freelance um, sole proprietor, starting their own consultancy. Mm -hmm. So it gives them that, that six month period. So, and within their membership, they have uh, an, an online portfolio. So this online portfolio means that they can go in, they can put their profile, their right. contact, right. Their right. case studies, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then, they can, if they choose, click a button and publish it to our find a designer directory, which right. is then accessible by the public. And the public in this instance really means for the graduates, potential employers, um, uh, potential commissioners of their work, and also allows them to access other members of the society who they may contact and mm. wish to seek advice from. Mm. So the, the online portfolio um, we developed and now we'll be able to be used by students to say, we'll create the year-end show. And mm -hmm. so we, we, we're packaging that together at the moment for those courses to say, um, you can search this by institution, by location, et cetera. It, it actually is going to give them a wider audience than they mm -hmm. would necessarily have in a geographical location. Um, really? So it's, this is, it's, it's, it's important for them. Let me let me ask you. You in the past, uh, this process of being a student in a design course, in an art of design course, 
It used to be a nine to five job. It used to be like um, earlier than nine and later than five in most cases. Um, today, lectures, we have to uh, have very limited contact time. I mean, it, 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 uh, it accumulates to less than a day or less than a day and a half per, per year with the students. Yep. Uh, what would be your advice on trying, how can we best deal with that from, from, from a lecture perspective and from a student perspective? Because right now the students have too many worries on, the, on, on, on their shoulders. It's, it's been a really challenging situation. I know, I think it's probably everywhere, but mm. I mean, in the UK, you know, there were some big changes in the mm. 80s in terms of mm. design and culture. Um, you know, the days of having two students on a course, like where I was experienced, I, I think are, are, are more longer. Like, more like 200. Oh, it was even 200. <laughs> we, have, we have courses where there, is, there literally is 200 on the course. Um, and, you know, we look in our program, we look at, well, what's the staff student ratio in that, yeah, in that course, situation? Yeah. But the staff student ratio is never going to be one to one. I mean, no. it just doesn't exist. Um, what I think is not happening as much as it used to and i think this is you know this is not not just a, a particular sector's fault this is also uh, maybe something that the profession needs to a, address but then it has economic issues as well mm. we used to have a lot more uh, visiting lecturers we used to have a situation where people would be going in not just to give a talk but actually going in for a period of time mm. um i remember having people come in and and, 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 and do two or two, uh, a, a whole day of lecturing yeah, and a couple, couple of times during the, 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 the term. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be the situation there. And, 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 and I think a lot of that was because a lot of the tutors also at the time, the lecturers were practitioners. Yes. So it, was, it, it was a joint thing. They were teaching and they were practicing. And I think one of the one of the issues that we've noticed over a period of time is lecturers don't always have the experience of practice, and so it's a difficult issue. I mean, you you can do a BA, then you do a master's, then you do a PhD, then you become a teaching fellow, then you become an assistant professor, then you become a professor, and and then you become a course leader, and you've actually never practiced, and I think those things have an impact um, because it's, it's what was relating earlier. I mean, you, you know, you work in a factory, stacking boxes, you learn about incredible, packing. Incredible learning. You, you, you practice in industry, you then have something that you can actually relate the process, that dry academic process. You have something that you can relate and illustrate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've lost an element of that over a period of time, which is, you know, one of the important things that we looked at at the program is being able to get practitioners to meet with students. Now, there are all sorts of issues involved in that. I realize that. And your comment about nine till five, um, I, 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 well, I, I, I never remember a nine till five o'clock as a student. I mean, you, of course not, of course not. I know students are there, you know, working, uh, you know, incredible hours always. Um, but do they have practitioners around them while they do it? Do they have the guidance of, of what practice is? And this, this, is a, this is a difficult one in design education. And it's a difficult one for the profession. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, there hasn't necessarily been that close contact with the profession and academia. Um, academia, sometimes we get the impression that it's gone down a particular route. Uh, Practitioners have gone down another route, all to do with economics, all to do with politics, all to do with government structuring of departments, etc., and how they fit in, all to do with quality assurance, all to do with um, you, you know the, the the fee structures, the contracts that students have, the learning outcomes that are demanded, uh, the tables need to um, be, be, be be targets for, for attracting students, the quotas, etc., and sometimes some of it, which is the basics. And, and not necessarily at the top, i.e., mm. how do you support somebody who's going through a learning experience to actually come out and productively work in a, in a career in yeah. what they wanted always to do? I, you know, I, I only know from anecdotal evidence when I talk to members, 
they have only ever wanted to be designers. And, and the thing is, it's one of the, I think it's probably one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, sectors with qualifications. I mean, you know, the percentage of people working in design with degree level is incredibly high compared to other sectors mm -hmm. of, of, of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there, there are issues with design education um, in terms of timing, in terms of resource, in terms of projects. How we tackle it? We start by being able to work together, that's, that's for sure, Brilliant. with the professionals being able to integrate design education and, and, and work with it. Because without design education, without design management, without design research, then it, there isn't a profession that you're underpinning. Part of a profession is that it is underpinned by a body of knowledge. And that body of knowledge can't just come from one group of people, it has to come from all mm, people. Mm, mm, mm. It also should include clients, by the way, and people who use the you know, three stakeholders as far as the society is concerned that we've always put down is, you know, design providers, but us as designers, or our, our members, etc., design users, clients, etc., whoever is commissioning, and design education. Three incredibly important stakeholders that need to be working together. We have a platform for being able to uh, assist those three stakeholders to, to talk, and that's what we're always trying to do, mm -hmm. is provide a platform for the discussion of how the profession is supported and how it's developed. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, so your, your recommendation needs to be that design education becomes more practice-based, basically. I think, how do, how, do, how, do, how, do, how do I say this in a, in a um, okay. <laughs> There is an enormous amount of um, focus on design thinking. Mm -hmm. And design thinking is, um, it become flavor of the month. Uh, it's, it's an incredible part of the design process, but it is part of the design process. It's, it's stuck at the thinking, not, we, we're not doing any design doing. <laughs> that, that, could be, that could be the case, and I think there's an argument to say that that is the case. Design thinking has become incredibly popular. Yes. The issue I think we have to do with design thinking is that designers have always done design thinking. Design thinking has always been part of the design process. What we tended to have probably over the last 15 years, although design thinking, I think the term originally coined by a good friend, uh, uh, Martin Derbyshire at Tangerine Design back in the 1980s in the publication Orange Book. I think they coined the phrase design thinking. I mean, this Bruce, was- Maybe Bruce Archer, maybe Bruce Archer. No, no, I'm telling you, Martin Derbyshire uh, at, at Tangerine when Jonathan Ives and um, Clive Brinley were working there, they, they, coined, they coined the phrase in a publication, I think 1980 something, um, design thinking. That's the first use I, I found of it. Um, but it's become an incredibly popular thing for people to latch on to, for, um, uh, for governments to, mm -hmm. to pick up on, um, for, you know, consultancies to pick up on. And, and, and what I believe it's been is that we have not necessarily been that good as a profession, as a, as, as, as a group of people in articulating what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. It's been left to others to actually deconstruct the process of design, take out an element which is design thinking is one element of it, and market that onwards. And it's become almost a discipline in itself, design thinking. Okay, maybe there's no issue with that. I, I think there's an issue for design uh, in the fact that that is an element that's taken out. And if that's the route that design goes down, when it is only doing design thinking, it's, you end up with pontificating, you end up with an indulgence. What, to me, the essence, essence of a designer is, is that the whole thing is linked together. It's design thinking and how do you implement it, mm. the implementation of design. And a lot of that, I can see why a lot of it is removed. I mean, you know, sort of at a point you would probably be studying design, you would, you would go out to a, a, a printer's, you would go to a manufacturer's. That's incredibly difficult now. Most of it is offshore. So you end up in a design school 
mm, designing graphic design, designing communication, designing packaging. How, how many companies are you able to actually go to now that are cutting cardboard, who are printing on paper, who are using other materials to actually form three-dimensional displays? How, 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 many, what, what, how, how many opportunities are there now for students to actually go and experience the smell of printing being, mm -hmm. to experience the smell of oil, to experience the, the smell of wood being cut in, in, in interior construction or, you know, and if you don't, if you don't experience those things, if you don't know those things, then it's very difficult, I think, sometimes to just be sitting, coming up with um, design thinking. It's the same as um, if, if you don't consider who's going to be using your design, how people are going to interact with your design, because you've not experienced people interacting, then you're working in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be uh, an issue. And so it's when I, when I talk to students and you know, they say about going on placements and they always, you know, wherever it is, they want to come to a placement in a big studio in London um, to, uh, to experience graphic design, to experience packaging design. And, 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 and not everybody can get a placement in a, in a, a, a high profile studio. You know, it doesn't work like that. Not with the amount of students we have. And as I say, it doesn't matter what you end up doing. Approach it from the point of view of, well, what's the design element in here? How can I end up benefiting from this? So if you want to do packaging, go work in a supermarket and stack some shelves for a week. <laughs> go and see what it's like to actually how, how do people reach to a shelf to get this down? How do people see at the top shelf what it says on this packaging? Um, because a supermarket will stack according to a, a sales directive, um, according to packaging research and information. What a design. What, what, what does a designer um, have as a, a, a brief? Now, going out, not just experiencing the client who's making the product that goes in the packaging, but go out and watch somebody buying it in the supermarket as to how they're walking around, especially now. I mean, now there's, now there's some really interesting issues in terms of design um, and, and space. We're going to have to completely rethink how people are reacting to products to in, in, in a, just in the consumer space in the supermarket, let alone all the complications of you know hotels, uh, interiors, restaurants, pubs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know go and experience it. See how people see how the operatives in the supermarket stack the product on a shelf and then see how the consumer takes off the shelf. That inputs into design thinking because actually that's about doing that's about actually getting it done and i think those are the things that need to be joined up especially the situation that we're in and how we're going to have to come out of this situation mm -hmm. this is a change people most there's an opportunity here for looking again to all the things that people are talking about when we need you know we're going to be more considerate to people we're going to be more friendly we're going to be i get all of that i get all of that but we're also going to have to rethink some of the things that designers probably have taken for granted for a long time. And so is the rest of the economy, so the rest of the, the community and society. And designers are really quite well placed for this rethinking exercise that, that's going to have to take place. So going back to what I said about students and graduates coming out, I think there are opportunities. Um, you, know, you just have to look and seize them. There are always opportunities. Um, I'm a total pessimist, but I remain an optimist. <laughs> Since we're on the subject, is there anything else you would uh, add, remove, replace, do differently in design education in order to, because, you know, your experience, uh, in order to maintain some of the elements of the past, how can we maintain some of the elements of the past into a, into a course today? Is there anything that you do differently? I think there's going to be an interesting period. It's not a matter of what, I don't know whether it's a matter of what people are going to constructively be doing now that's going to influence things. I think it's going to be the circumstances surrounding that are going to influence the way we do things. I mean, an enormous amount, of, well, obviously, all education at the moment in the UK is being delivered online. Mm -hmm. 
that is now changing the whole paradigm for design education. I think we're going to actually pick up a lot more of virtual education, online education, which has implications for universities and whether, you know, whether they can sustain, whether they can survive, which courses can, which courses can't. So the courses are probably going to develop and have a wider audience in one go. I mean, you can, online, you can be, you can be given a learning experience to a lot more people in one go than in a, in, in a particular physical location. That may offer opportunities for actually being able to have more interaction with industry and with other people at different periods. So what I would be moving towards or suggesting is that we have to have more integration with the economy of designers. When we, when, when we talk to um, courses and we talk about being multidisciplinary, quite often it's multidisciplinary within a design framework, i.e. Uh, an interior designer with a product designer, with a graphic designer, with a fashion designer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I mean by interdisciplinary really is working with all of those other professions, whether it's ergonomists, um, whether it's scientists, uh, technicians, uh, accountants, management consultants, et cetera, et cetera. So integrating, I think there's a lot of people that can come into courses who are not just designers. Courses like to, like to have designers come um, to talk to students. I think we need to get people who are not just designers coming to integrate in design education and talk to students. Now, it, it's an issue because of the attention span of students. And I think, you know, we have to get around that. We have to negotiate it. What, what we found over, uh, uh, over a few years now is that a lot of the extramural activity, a lot of additional learning experience is not that easy to deliver because the students focus rightly because of the fact that they're paying tuition fees is focused on getting 120 credits a year, getting those 360 credits and getting the degree and getting out and into the workplace. That, that, that's admirable, I, 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 I get that. But what we need to do is to be able to lead them forward and be able to show them that it's not just about that. There's other elements that need to come into here. And there's probably gonna be the need for a lot of more extramural activity, um, working, as you say, it's not just nine till five. And I mean, you know, sometimes I think there's a, there's a big issue there is that if it's not in the curriculum, if it's not in the modular structure, then it doesn't have a credit value. It doesn't have a weighting. Um, we, 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 it's not important. Well, it is incredibly important. It's important to actually be doing things that you're not going to get any credits for because that is your investment in the future and being a professional designer and not just being a professional designer, but being a successful professional designer. That's, that's, that's just as important. Um, so I would say getting more and more uh, outside experience, outside influence, into, in, 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 into design education. It's therefore broadening, broadening. Um, and I, 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 I would assume that given the current context and coming out of this, there are probably gonna be some government um, initiatives, whether they're carried out successfully or not, so it depends on how, how you view it, but there's gonna be some initiatives to actually widen the scope of educational courses across the spectrum mm. to involve more the development within the economy, because we're going to have to, in, in any country, we're going to have to focus on the restructuring here. This is going to have to be uh, a whole new thinking about um, learning experience, training, development of people. Not, you know, there's already a move to technical education um, and technical degrees uh, within the UK and, you know, higher level apprenticeship, etc. There's, there's, I think there's going to be a move back to almost the polytechnic structure of education where it is very much open and designers have always been regarded as, you know, so if you're incredibly successful, you become a polymath in many ways. So I think, you know, this opening up is going to be incredibly important over the coming probably five to ten years, actually. That's very exciting. That's very exciting. Uh, yeah. You mentioned I wish I was coming out now. It'd be interesting. You mentioned online education. Uh, design education 
has more or less always since the earliest days of the of the apprenticeship, before even colleges and universities, uh, has, has always been a one-to-one -one process. The transmission of principles and and even what what a person is to become, even mm -hmm. it's always a very much tailor-made. Yeah? We know the by, by personality. We know them by what they're doing. What what they're so. How does that side? Uh, how does that uh, go with with the online? Because because yet you can talk to more, but you cannot individually teach more. Yeah, I, I, I guess this is this is where the processes and the methodologies are actually have adapted for what the economy is about, what the circumstances are about. So, um, you know, sort of modular learning has, has developed more and more over the years, um, bite-sized learning mm. uh, and online learning. And may well be that the whole educational model needs to change. And can we de be delivering education to, I'll, I'll talk specifically in terms of, designer. Can we be delivering design education in a different way, perhaps over a much longer period? And therefore, you know, when I said before doing a foundation year, you used to do the foundation year in three years, that was four years. You would then come out and go into a design studio and you would work there for three years. And the, the, you know, the, the, the saying was, well, you come in and we'll knock off all the rough edges and we'll get you into the the, the, the mode of working within the studio and our style and etc. So you really were serving a seven year yes. learning yes. experience. Yes. That is no longer the case. In actual fact, even now, just the three years is being condensed, I think probably out of the experience we're going through at the moment, it may be condensed even more. Is that graduates and having to pay, a, a lot of the surveys are showing they actually want to do a degree in two years. They don't want to end up spending three months on holiday, on, on, on vacation. They want to get the degree done uh, in two years and get out into the workplace. So I think if we're looking at saying, okay, well, design education is taking place, place over a longer period of time or any education, then there is the scope that there could be more one-to-one -one in different situations, i.e. learning on the job. Could become is more of a one-to-one -one experience so not just online throughout but the educational experience could span four five six years and i don't, I don't know but i think we have to have that discussion as Absolutely. to can, can you now just say three years a degree or do we end up saying no a degree is something <laughs> You, you do sandwich courses, you do part-time courses, you do, um, you know, adult learning, open university courses, so it takes, it takes much longer to get a degree. Do we end up, do we end up with that as a phased approach to a degree? Because coming out with a degree, whilst the degree is important, still an enormous amount of employers in the design sector will look at a degree as to which university you got that degree from. And so in, in effect, they're not looking at the degree, they're looking at the situation, they're looking at where you got your learning experience, where did you do it, where, where, was, where was this built up? Now, it could well be that the same approach is going to be, well, uh, what experience have you got over uh, learning and working and development over a, a longer period? And, you know, the old model of going into a a consultancy and working for three years after you come out of a degree is it, it, it's probably no longer possible. I mean, this, it's, we're very much in a post-loyal era in terms of employment. Um, you know, you you lose your contracts and you know you you have to get rid of staff. You know, it's it, it's no longer guaranteed that you will go to a studio and work there for twenty years, fifteen, twenty years, and develop. Um, and people want to move on. They're more dynamic now. Um, they want to shift from one company to the next to gain experience, to, to get a better job, to get a better position, to, to get better experience of design in the different clients. It could get a, it's quite understandable. So maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to have a more dynamic 
education process that spans a longer period. And does that offer the possibilities for more one-to-one -one teaching or learning experience, but learning from people who are practitioners rather than always lecturers? And is there a combination there? Um, I don't know the answer. Mm, um, but, uh, as designers, we need to think of all the possibilities. Um, and it's probably going to be a matter of experimentation, of incremental development. Yeah. Um, but that's what, and taking risks. And, and that's, what, that's what the design process is. I mean, one of, the, one of the big issues we always have now with design courses is, have you built in enough risk into the projects? Have you built in the fact that if a project fails, there is a very valid learning experience within that failure? Have you built that in? Or is it a case that you don't get the credits, the weighting's wrong, et cetera, et cetera? So, you know, whenever we're doing, whenever we're doing an accreditation, we always look at the stuff and we always say, we'll, we'll set conditions and we'll set recommendations. And recommendations, I, I don't know, we recommend that you, I don't know, and, and knock out that wall and have some more studio space for, life drawing if that was ever the case um you know so 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 that, that's a recommendation a condition would be you must do this uh we always have conditions which is to do with you must um introduce intellectual property into in, into the modules etc etc so when we when we look at this is can we start saying there are conditions that need to be um put into modules which is there has to be a risk element and However you've structured your uh, credits or weighting, you need to build in the fact that part of the design process is about failing and moving on to the next stage. Analyzing, scoping, analyzing, developing. Analyzing, did it fail? Do I go in this direction? Did it succeed? I'll go in this direction. In education sometimes, there's no element of risk built in. And risk is incredibly important in learning. Uh, I, I, I always remember going to a, a, a talk where a guy was talking, he worked on the, we, we have in the UK a, a Harrier jump jet, which is a, a jet that just vertical takeoff plane. Um, and he worked on that, and this was like, I don't know, 40, 40 years ago. And he was just saying, there was no health and safety involved at that point. Um, no position from a health and safety executive as to how you did these things. But everybody who worked on that project looked after the person standing next to them and there were fewer accidents in that situation than when you ended up having directives which everybody said oh well somebody said this so it must be safe you didn't need to take the risk and that i think is a is a big issue you do need to take risks and in design education i think you need to build in more risk taking uh, for students because they're going to come out and work in a very risky environment Brilliant. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's brilliant. So you, you partly sort of talked a lot about employment and employability and all these things. So is there anything else you, you would like to say on the topic of how can we help students in that transition? Because you, you, you said some very interesting things about that. But is there anything else we can do uh, from the student side and from the lecturer side on getting that transition through from education to employability? Yeah, I, 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 I like to use it because we, 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 we trademarked it from, from, from learning to earning. Um, how do you get in that transition? And I, I, I think the, the, the one thing is, it's, it goes back to the old saying, you don't give somebody fish, you teach them how to fish. And I think at, uh, at, at, at the learning experience level, what we need to have is um, tutors who are saying, look, you need to be planning and knowing how you set your development targets for when you come out of here. It's okay, we look at the project now in this semester and you put down a personal, I mean, you have personal development plans, uh, PDPs um, within the course. So you put down your own personal development as you're moving along in, 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 the, in the projects. What I think we need to do, and this is always a condition that we put in for our courses, is that by the end of the course, the student, when they graduate, they have to have a CPD plan in place, a mm -hmm. continuous professional development plan. They have to have it in place. So they, we start in, in the course to, uh, to, to, to show them the benefit of planning their professional development. It doesn't finish once you've got your degree. That's, that, that, in, 
in many ways. And you know, if any students are listening, I, I apologize, but that's the easy part. <laughs> the difficult part is now putting it into practice. That was the how to do it. <laughs> Put it into practice. But you need a plan, you need a roadmap, you need a direction. Now it's like anything else, it's like a business plan. When you write a business plan, it's all you know, there's a, a lot of optimism and it's going to work. You build in the risk, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. After a week, something alters and you need to alter the plan, you need to throw it out and stuff. It doesn't matter what matters if you've got one. There's never a right and a wrong one. As you go through the career, this is going to change. I mean, you know, if I think now of what my personal uh, continued professional development plans were when I came out of college was find out more about what I was designing about, etc. Now, you know, that professional development plan is to do with all the things I don't know, the things I don't do, um, you know, uh, management, uh, you know, behavioral sciences, uh, etc., etc. Now, you, you need to be able to put those down and see that roadmap. And if you follow it, it's great. But while you're following it, you need to analyze what it is that you're doing. So I think the biggest thing that can happen for uh, students coming out to prepare them is for them to finish their course with some sort of direction, professional development direction. As I say, it probably changes. But if they come out with that, we can then pick it up as the profession in the professional body when, when they continue their membership, hopefully, touch wood, when they continue their membership. Um, we can pick that up and work with them to develop it because when they have their, as I mentioned before, their online portfolio, there are toolkits in there for, a, for the CPD plan. It allows them to audit what they've done in the past year. It allows them to analyze the value and the benefit of it against the framework, CPSK. And it allows them then to put down a plan for the next year. If they haven't done too much uh, development in the P or the S, they can then say, well, next year we're going to do some development in the P and the S uh, criteria. And when they come to the following year, they realize they haven't done it. That's fine. The important thing is realizing what you've done, identifying what you need to do, and then trying to achieve it. But setting goals and targets, not 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 massive goals and targets, um, but goals and targets, and to move students away, if possible, from what I regard as the celebrity culture of design. Mm, 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 mm. It's not a case now of saying, well, what do you want? I, I want to be a celebrity designer. I want to be a high-profile designer. Celebrity. Always used to come with the fact that you were good at what you did. You 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 became good first, and then you may become a celebrity. You cannot start by wanting to be a celebrity. And I think you know a lot of the things that go on in the design sector when we talk about awards. Um, you know, it, 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 sometimes it, 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 it makes me smile. It's not always about awards. It's about doing the job professionally. But for designers, designers love awards. They love getting design awards. You know, so you can see how many there are. Um, and people make a lot of money out of them. I mean, that's, you know, that's, we, 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 don't, we don't run those awards. Um, but you can, you, you can see how we get them. There's nothing better than a designer getting an award unless the award is presented by another designer. That, that, that's the ultimate then, and especially a celebrity designer. But the focus can't be on wanting to be with a celebrity designer. Mm. It has to be. Wanted to be a professional designer, and then you know, a fair wind and some good luck, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and an enormous amount of hard work, you may become a celebrity. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. How can our viewers and listeners find more about you and your work? Uh, they can go to our website, uh, which is www. Obviously, um, csd.org.uk. And it's an incredibly well-designed website, and so it's very easy to to navigate. Um, and you can find all the information, find the history of the society, split into decades going back, um, you know, to the 1930s, because the history of the society runs parallel to the history uh, of design. I mean, you know, we're talking about the great designers who are members and founders of the society. Uh, you know, Milner Gray, Misha Black. Um, Terence Conrad, 
um, you know, Norman Foster, Lord Foster, uh, Richard Rogers, uh, Lord Rogers of Riverside, uh, you know, with, with Terry Farrell, you know, people who were instrumental in developing the South Bank and the Festival of Britain, Abram Games in the 1950s. Uh, you know, the, the society was formed by artists and designers. So Graham Sutherland, the, the artist, uh, John Piper, uh, Nash, uh, you know, all these painters, Dick Francis, novelist, um, Gerald Scarf, cartoonist. You know, the history of the society is the history of design. That's, that's all on the website. It's a fascinating read. Mm -hmm. but then there's a book, which is the important thing about how you become a member of the society. That's all there as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. In, in many different categories. Any 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 last advice before before we close? Is there something you'd like to say? <sighs> the, the, the advice I always end up giving students when I do a talk in coming out is there's two pieces of advice. Is one, learn to draw something very that's very simple, but learn to draw it upside down because it really impresses people when you sit at the table opposite them and you draw you draw something very simple upside down and they're amazed. Um, and the other thing that I think is incredibly important to do when you're sitting at that table is not just learn to draw upside down, but learn to read upside down and see what the person's making the notes about what you've just said, etc. And, and, and find your position when you come out. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much for, for a very, very great talk. Thank My pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you. Take, take care, lecturers. Bye-bye.